health is a very good metaphor for what we mean by prosperity, because health really is a kind of balancing act. You know, it's not about having more and more as we write into the DNA of capitalism. It's actually about the balance between having too little and too much. It's about the balance between self and other. It's about the balance between, you know, continually innovating and being bedded in tradition. And these balances, you know, that we had to learn and relearn through the pandemic in our lives are also important, I think, in thinking about, you know, what prosperity is, what the economy should be doing and how there might be a kind of actually a better life for us outside of, of capitalism. <laughs> Dr. Tim Jackson as my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Tim is an ecological economist and writer. Since 2016, he has been director of the Center for the Understanding of Sustainable Prosperity, CUSP is the acronym, at the University of Surrey in the UK, where he is also professor of sustainable development. From 2004 to 2011, he was economics commissioner for the UK Sustainable Development Commission, where his work culminated in the publication of Prosperity Without Growth in 2019, and then I guess a second printing in 2017, which has subsequently been translated in 17 foreign languages. It was named as Financial Times Book of the Year in 2010 and Un Unheard's Economic Book of the Decade in 2019. His latest book, Post Growth Life After, After Capitalism, was published by Polity Press in 2021 this year. In 2016, Tim was awarded the Hillary Laureate for Exceptional International Leadership and Sustainability. In addition to his academic work, Tim is an award-winning dramatist with numerous radio writing credits for the BBC. Tim holds multiple degrees in uh, mathematics from Massachusetts and Cambridge, philosophy from Massachusetts U Uni Western Ontario, uh, master's in arts at the University of Western Ontario and physics, PhD St. Andrews, he also holds an honorary degrees, University of Brighton in the UK, and many, many other. Tim, welcome to the show. Sorry for messing up your biography. There no, no is worries. so much you've been no doing. Worries. Yeah, I just have to be, I just have to, uh, it must be, I've just realized how confusing my biography is um, if you're from the US, because, because it's uh, MA doesn't stand for Massachusetts, it stands for Master of Arts, and it was actually Master Cambridge, Cambridge, England, um, yeah. and for historical reasons, Cambridge gives only Master of Arts degrees um, at bachelor level. Um, so it's a it's a, it's a, a slightly confusing biography, but um, uh, and, mostly and it, in the it, UK. It's it's really not. It's just me because I'll <laughs> tell you what I'm nervous as hell, which is hard for me to do because I. I revere you. I think you are an amazing man. You've done a lot of things. And your your books uh, tickle my heart because it's the type of questions, the type of wisdom, the type of thinking around ecological economics that I've been waiting and looking for for decades. And uh, not only is your TED Talk fabulous, but you just come right out there and so eloquently say it and you say it in a simple language for everyone to clearly understand. And uh, so I think I, I, I should have gotten it, but honestly, I'm a little bit nervous because <laughs> I'm so excited to finally well, uh, be speaking with you. Thank you, Mark. I mean, I'm flattered and um, there's no need to be nervous because um, <clears throat> I mean, I'm actually, interestingly, for the number of times I've done this, I shouldn't be nervous at all, but of course, you know, every time is different. You never know what's going to happen. So there's always a degree of, of not quite knowing uh, what the situation is going to be. But I'm really pleased to be here and I'm looking forward to the conversation. I am too. And so I've got both of your books here. Uh, and I've introduced them already. Prosperity Without Growth. Fabulous read. Um, you might know that I'm a sustainable development goal advocate for the United Nations. Speak about them quite a bit. But even before that time, you were 
doing sustainable development commission and quite a bit of work around that and also discussing it here, but also doing reports as well. Um, and, and then this year, thank goodness, and uh, hopefully the pause and the pandemic and other things that were still under the way uh, brought this wonderful work about post-growth. Um, what I've led up with your biography, what you've told me, what, what I see and read in your books, you've been doing this for quite some while. And uh, whether it's sustainable development or ecological economics, um, you've been around the block, you've given the TED Talks, you've done the work, you've done the professorship, you've taught the courses, um, you've been doing this for a long time. But my real question is, how have you weathered this crazy time? Has all that work that you've done around sustainable development, talking about uh, climate change and we need to have other economic models and that the current models and the ones that we've had in the past weren't working and really a lot of stuff wasn't working before the pandemic, but then we were, we were struck and hit with this time of craziness. And it wasn't just economic downturn, it was uh, the pandemic and the crazy inauguration and Black Lives Matters and Asian racism and on and on. Um, did you weather this time good? Did any new models uh, bubble up to the surface or any learning lessons? And most of all, all that stuff that you, you've been talking about for, for all these years, did that give you any more resilience to be prepared or to, to say, Okay, here we go. Here it's coming, and and I feel prepared. So I just want genuinely know how you and your family have been, but also what what are the learning lessons? And does being sustainable or thinking about ecological economics serve to be a better model in hard times? I think it's, I hadn't really thought about that specifically, Mark. But I suppose in a way, um, I, I suppose in a way, it, it could be said to be true. Um, I mean, let me say first of all. You know, it was tough for everyone um, through these last times. I think, by comparison with many of the people, and even some of my students, and some of the people that I'm responsible for at, at Cusp, um, you know, it has not been a, a, a difficult um, period in as by comparison with with the difficulties that some people have had, and um, you know, it has made it's changed my life. It obviously um, it's changed the way that I think slightly. It's changed the interactions that I have with my with my students, everything being online and constructing these slightly strange relationships that that you never met each other, and yet you you have to reach a level at which you can talk and understand each other um, um, in 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 order to function, really, in order to get through that. And and of course, you know, I have been able to continue to work, and and I think that's one of the things that struck me as a luxury, I would say. Um, because I think because I think work matters. I think it's important to us. I think our participation in society kind of hangs off that ability to be able to contribute. And, and our identity is also hung up with that as well. So, you know, I haven't had to make huge sacrifices in terms of giving up work. Um, and, and I feel actually, although, you know, sometimes I would like to have an easier day and a holiday sounds like a brilliant idea and, a you know, a nine month holiday sounds absolutely fantastic I know that it's not you know I know that people who have um, had to go into that situation where they couldn't conduct their business they couldn't attend their place of work they couldn't they didn't have proper places to work and sometimes they were not physically not allowed to work um, that's a really difficult place to me it seems to, to be uh, it seems to me and and um, you know, I may be a little bit strange in that respect. I put it down to my slightly Puritan upbringing, but I kind of think work matters, not, not in a formal sense, not in necessarily in an institutional sense, but in that ability to, you know, to participate in society, to take action in the world. And to some extent, I think that is a, you know, it is a lesson from the pandemic. It, it, in order to, to con one of the things that went missing so fast was that kind of busyness around which our lives have been structured. And when it goes away, you're left in a space where you don't understand it anymore. You don't understand your role properly. You don't understand your relationships in the same way anymore. And to have that focus on your action in the world, to be able to keep that focus, you know, I think was a, was a huge privilege and I'm not suggesting it's not available to other people because I, it certainly was. And 
and obviously those who were working on the front line through that pandemic they you know they they had the opposite problem in a sense they were 24 7 really engaged in a in a very very difficult situation but i think you know behind all that there's this interesting lesson for us that we think what we want is some kind of empty relaxing space where everything is provided for us and everything is materially comfortable and and actually there's something else that is more important to us and and in in learning that lesson through the pandemic i think it is something that we can sort of take forward in understanding how society might change and how we might actually construct meaning and purpose beyond the consumer society that really just stopped um, when the pandemic struck. I, I want to go just a little bit deeper. So we, we know that bubbles and, and problems were surfacing well before the pandemic uh, on uh, economic models around the world and economies around the world and and just uh, this bigger unease of, of humanity um, in relationship to their governments and to their to the bigger governance uh, societies around the world where we're saying just the world isn't working for everyone all over the place there's uh, this dis-ease this big dis-ease being felt and there there's this you know, this problems theory from Einstein, where he says, you know, uh, we need to come up with different models to solve our problems, not the same thinking that created those problems, you know, use different models and in and, and economics and different systems around the world, it seems like we see these bubbles, whether it's a real estate bubble, financial or tech bubble, and they come up and then they burst or they come close to teetering and then there's a bailout, but it just goes right back to that same old model. And um, were there some learning lessons or some things that bubbled up during this time that, it, that we also got a better glimpse of where some of the things that truly need to be fixed are in, in our models? And, and um, before we go into deeper into your books, but were there some other things, some other learning lessons that came up where it says, oh, that's definitely some areas we need to focus on and, and, and adjust? Yeah, I, th I think I think so. I mean, um, you know, I kind of um, one of one of the things and I do talk about it a little bit in 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 post growth is this sort of idea of how important health is to us. And that obviously was brought home very, very clearly and and almost to the to the point for me where I begin to think that actually health is a very good metaphor for what we mean by prosperity. Because health really is a kind of balancing act. You know, it's not about having more and more as we write into the DNA of capitalism. It's actually about the balance between having too little and too much. It's about the balance between self and other. It's about the balance between, you know, continually innovating and being bedded in tradition. And these balances, you know, that we had to learn and relearn through the pandemic in our lives are also important, I think, in thinking about you know, what prosperity is, what the economy should be doing and how there might be a kind of actually a better life for us outside of, of capitalism. And, um, you know, I don't, I, I don't think we should think that's necessarily immediately going to follow from the pandemic or that it's going to be easy to get to, but just that there were glimpses through that, you know, really tragic time in, in so many ways of, of different ways of living, different ways of being. There, there, I mean, one big surprise I had, which is kind of on a tangent is, you know, the big problems during this, this whole pause, there was a lot of unrest around the inauguration and the whole voting factor and that was turning America and the rest of the world kind of upside down with what was going on there. And that when, when Biden and Harris got into office immediately that they, I'm glad they doubled down on the environment and the climate and they started to kind of get back in the Paris Agreement. But I was thinking, why didn't they fix the, the voting thing back in 2005 with Al Gore, uh, the dimple chat in, in, in Florida? Um, you know, we're still today in 2021 dealing with old things that should have been fixed decades ago. And, and now we're just going to wait till the next vote. That, that might be a little bit uh, of a tangent. But in your books, really, the beginning 
is with with an older book, uh, The Limits to Growth from the Meadows Report, uh, Donella, Dennis Meadows, your grander, Steve Barron's uh, Duner, who wrote The Limits to Growth. It was uh, uh, paid for by the Volkswagen Foundation or Stiftung, as you'd say in Germany, and the Club of Rome. And it's really about systems thinking, dynamic modeling, uh, uh, and this approach to uh, and there's a big play of economics in there. There's a big role of this, you know, there is a limit to, to growth, capitalism. And um, a lot um, is, is based off of that type of thinking, but as well, one other, and I, and I happen to have a couple of his books here, and I'm just going to hold them up, but I want to mention them. And, and then I want to go into how you kind of got on this journey. And, and that's Herman Daly, you know, I have the uh, ec ecological economics. This is actual academic book of the course that I took. Um, and then here's is another other uh, ecological economics book from Herman Daly, who actually left the World Bank, um, you know, because he, he saw a lot of things that were working. And one thing I like about your writing style is you not you don't only give us the history, so to say, you give us the behind the scenes of personal people who are real people who are nice people who are people you want to understand their story of their marriages and life and how this evolved and happened just like they do in your life and in my life and and um i really like how that's progressed but me coming from uh, what i was one of the first 50 people trained by al gore and his ranch in carthage tennessee well um, you know, we're talking Dr. James Hansen, we're talking these original ways of doing things. There's this story of how this training, this learning, this history has emerged. And I'm, I, I like how you weed that into or weave that into so nicely into your books and into your stories so that we can understand why is it important and how does it fit into our lives. So how did you come across that how did this journey thing is that just yeah. something that every economist uh no not at all i mean uh, okay no i mean those economists start out in all sorts of different ways but, uh, but for me that was a really important part of things maybe it comes from that sort of dramatist in me that it's people's stories that really motivate me that that i that connect me to ideas and and that you know everybody all the ideas that we have were the ideas of people and all those people had lives and all of those lives had their own characteristics and so actually embedding the life and the story and the ideas all together in some ways it's a little bit of a device but it is a very effective device because it is to people that we relate and and so you know you can do all the all the concept and theory and all the textbooks that you like but it doesn't necessarily reach people and 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 that was in a way that was a kind of you know learning that i had from from prosperity without growth from the earlier books that it was it was written for policymakers it was written um, logically rationally yes I used some of that story as a means of communication but it was essentially trying to persuade policymakers to make changes and I have to say you know in that in that sense it wasn't an outstanding success because the policymakers just did not want to talk about growth at all really um, except to kickstart it and get it back after the financial crisis but actually you know following that what seemed to be a completely disorderly launch of a government report um, out of that emerged this huge and very enriching conversation with all sorts of people, people who were in their 80s and had been there in the limits to growth debate back in the 60s and 70s, people who were just starting out in economics and wanted a different kind of economics. All of these people just kind of flooding into the space and that I did not know was there around this conversation. And, and the, the fact, I think the fact that it was a report to government was one of the reasons why that happened so um, extensively why so many people joined that debate in that way at that time so I'm, I don't regret it being a report to government but I do feel that what it you know what it what it was was a, a kind of opportunity to to really restart this conversation and I was humbled really by the response to that and and talking of the characters I mean Herman I've known for for a long time and he's always been very supportive and and he we actually 
brought him into that process at the Sustainable Development Commission, some background seminars that we organized thinking about prosperity, thinking about steady state economy. So I knew Herman quite well, but I just want to tell a little story of an anecdote where, you know, one of the sets of people that, that invited me to talk after Prosperity Without Grace was published was um, something called the Balaton Group, which was set up around a, a, an annual meeting in Balaton in Hungary um, to sort of bring together the people who've been involved in the Limits to Grace debate every year and to, and to you know, just brainstorm and be there and network and discuss. And I turned up at, at the, on the shores of Lake Balaton and one of the first people who came up to me um, he was an elderly gentleman, you know, bearded um, in his late 70s, probably, and he stuck his camera in my face. And it was an old style camera and he clicked the camera and he said, that's one for the bulletin board. And then he introduced himself to me and it was Dennis, Dennis Meadows. Meadows. Yep. And I, I, I knew just, you were going to say that. It was, it was just one of those moments, you know, and the next day he came bearing a gift, which was just this extraordinary icon to me of a first edition of Limits to Growth, which, um, you know, was it was the last spare one that he had. And he presented it to me and it was, it, you know, you're touching history, you're touching ideas, you're touching the sense of these people. And I think that's something that we should not forget. I think some of, you know, some of what I wanted to do, particularly in post-growth in in reconnecting people to the ideas and to the people is to say, look, you're not in a vacuum. You're not in the wilderness. These ideas are here. And the people who had them, to some extent, their spirit lives on through those ideas. Their influence is important to you. And, and in a world in which we're dominated by kind of, you know, the, the, the likes that you get on Twitter and you're inclined to forget the ideas have depth and they have history and they have biography and they have personality. And, and I find that, you know, a little bit sometimes with my students that they, they are apt to want to, and, and it's perfectly understandable. You want to make your mark, you want to create your space. And what I want to say to them is do not forget your elders, do not forget these people who came before, N not because they will overshadow you, but because they will support you and they will be a part of the resource through which your work will become richer. And, and it was a, you know, I think that's a, a very important thing to remember. It, it is so important. And I look back at all the years, I, I'm still a student in, in many respects. And I, I look at our time together today as a huge learning lesson, but there's maybe a handful of professors and, and teachers that I truly remembered. And it's because there was a personal connection and a story and a history. And it wasn't, I didn't get treated like a number or a robot that I actually learned something from their courses and they gave me something of value. Once I left the, the classroom, once I left the university that uh, I'll never forget. And to this day, I, I just absolutely knew that that you were going to say that was Dennis Meadows. And I have I have an interesting story. So not only is the limits to growth, they call it the climate science Bible now in, in many of the circles, especially in, in, in climate reality project with Al Gore. But I was having an email exchange with with Dennis. Um, who, who lives in New Hampshire, I lived in, in New Hampshire as well. And um, we were discussing him beyond the show and talking about some of the other things of how the limits to growth and the whole community of limits to growth and things. And, and he says, yeah, I'm retiring. I've, I've passed on the baton. I've, I, you know, he's, he had some severe uh, sadness with, with Dana's loss, his wife, uh, Donella Meadows and, and, um, and, and many other things that he's been fighting a long fight for a long time, but doing some very, very wonderful things. And I said, more power to you, take, take some time off. But in his retirement, he, he donated uh, to, to the county that he lives in, his entire property. He lives on this, used to live on a ranch with his wife and, and, and different things. And it's just really neat how he he's made a big impact. He's he's done the fight, but it's really about all of us to 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 pick up the baton and take those wisdoms and bring them to a much clearer model in the future. The crazy thing is there's so many multiple learning lessons out of that as well. So the Volkswagen Foundation Stiftung in German is a, is 
a sister company of the Volkswagen company who did Dieselgate in 2015. They're the ones who paid for this climate science Bible, this beautiful report, which says there's a limit to growth. And apparently they didn't read it at all. Or, uh, and I've heard, okay, they're separate companies. That's not true. I'm sorry, it's bullshit. They're the same company. They know what's going on. And, and, and now they're, they've been fined and they're moving forward in a positive direction, I hope, I believe. Um, the reason I bring that up it's unique how that book that was written in 1972, Dennis Meadows, and that can have an impact on you, on me, and on the future, because it talked about the exact things that we're experiencing now. There is a limit to growth. Capitalism can't go on forever. Your books, post-growth, you know, uh, prosperity without growth. Um, and I'm wondering how many people ha have, have read the book and, and, and move forward. So it's important that this collective intelligence that we have out this intelligence out there, that we get that wisdom so that we know it existed and learn how to apply it. Um, I, I, I really want to touch on Herman Daly for just a moment. You are an ecological e economist, and, and that's, mm -hmm. uh, I guess, that. Uh, but did it start out that way? And, and how <laughs> was, was it Herman Daly that, that got you on that path? Because, I mean, as an economist, it's usually uh, white elderly men who, who go through this type of a degree or become economists. It's not very many females in the industry, and uh, very f even fewer people of color. But how do you get onto the path from this capitalism or these other economic models to one of ecological economic? And, and is it a struggle? Is it a battle? Or you have scars and wounds all over? Or how how does that work? Can you help us there? Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, I I call myself an ecological economics because it's a label that's out there, and it's actually one that Herman, you know, more or less created um, for people. Who, who were thinking about the economy, but weren't necessarily thinking about it in a conventional way. And I certainly wasn't. I mean, I wasn't actually trained as an economist. I, I, I think a, a you know, more accurate title for me would be an accidental economist. I mean, it doesn't look quite so um, convincing on the website, but it's more, it's more in keeping with reality. And, and, and I didn't start anywhere near economics. In fact, in my, when I was at school, I I did a couple of economics classes and I could not understand them. I could not understand who they were talking about. I could not understand the terminology of it. The language did not connect with me. And so, you know, economics was the last thing in the world that I wanted to do um, as I was working my way through, through my education. And, and, and I came back to it really because I needed to. And, and the story of coming back to it, you know, went through this education, as you mentioned around maths and, and philosophy in particular, where I began to think more deeply about the world. But also this excursion into, into drama and the arts and theatre, which I absolutely loved and was my escape out of the dryness of academia. So much so that when I left um, university after completing my PhD, that's what I thought I was going to do. I was going to be writing plays and I'd already sold a couple of plays to the BBC. Um, and and I, I'd also received the paychecks for them and realized they weren't very much. So I was working part time during that period when I was still thinking I was going to be a playwright um, and just, you know, serving in bars and cafes and restaurants and doing laboring jobs and that kind of thing in London. And then in April um, 1986, very, very precise moment in time, um, the number four reactor in Chernobyl, Chernobyl melted down. And, and I don't know why it affected me so, so deeply, but I remember it very, very clearly. I can even remember the day when it happened because I was traveling through the British countryside outside London, looking at this beautiful sky, listening to the radio and the radio telling us that the radiation from Chernobyl was coming towards the UK and was already being detected in the sheep in Wales. And, and this, you know, this image actually of a fragile world, a fragile planet in which humanity's technology was creating dangers that we could not even see sometimes and I sort of it for some reason it had a profound effect on me and, and and the next day more or less I kind of thought I was thinking you know I've got these skills a lot of my contemporaries for example in the in the physics department where I was doing my PhD um, had gone into the nuclear industry they were people you know those skills were creating these technologies 
And so I kind of thought to myself, you know, if the skills are, are being dedicated to the creation of these technologies, which are threatening not just our, our existence, but the planet itself, um, then maybe they can also be used in a different direction. And I walked through the door of the Greenpeace office in London and said, look, you know, I don't know if I'm any good to you, but I've got a PhD in physics and a degree in mathematics. I want to do something. Can you find me a job? And they found me, you know, really a volunteer's job, just working on the economics of renewable energy uh, technologies. You know, if we're not going to have uh, nuclear and we're not going to have fossils, what are we going to have? Where is our energy? It's got to be in these new technologies. We need a little bit of insight into that. And so I became an economist, initially just the kind of microeconomics of, of financial appraisal of renewables and so on. And then eventually, as I began to see how the system worked and how embedded we were in this ideology of growth, eventually that sort of critique of growth. And there Herman actually was one of the, you know, the first most influential figures. It was actually a, a graph, a figure that he had in a book called For the Common Good, which he wrote with John Cobb. Um, and at the end of that book, they have an annex where they have this index of sustainable economic well-being. And I remember, again, very distinctly that day I was in London in a crowded room above a bookshop, which is where those kinds of meetings happened at that point. And Greg Katz, who was working with Bill Keepin at that time on the relative economics of nuclear power and, 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 and other technologies, he just happened to put up this picture, this one graph of the GDP, that growth path growing and growing against the index of sustainable economic welfare, which grew for a while and then flattened off completely as, as welfare departed from the growth in GDP. And that was the moment that, you know, that, that, that led me to this conundrum around the organization of our economy entirely around the pursuit of growth and the damage that that was doing environmentally and socially. Yeah, and and you and as you your entire first book prosper your book prosperity uh, without growth it really I don't think you I mean it was probably a failure for the politicians or the or the the those who are making policies or, or needed to to hear it because they didn't want to hear it but it's really a, it's a better model it's a better way of looking and it is so much more like how the world really works and has always worked. Um, and so that, that, that I, I really think that it's the best that we, you know, um, that's probably about the all I want to say about the prosperity without growth, because mm. I really think that you set the tone there enough and that, that I mean, I think it's interesting. It's interesting what you say there about, you know, the, that that's kind of the way that's a pragmatic a way, the way the world works. And that's been the nature of the conversations that I have had that have been inspired by prosperity without growth was from, you know, ordinary people in different sectors of the economy who recognizing actually that there's a different way of thinking there. And it's a pragmatic, entirely definable, meaningful, pragmatic approach to change and 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 that's uh, that's kind of what I wanted for the book. Yeah, and I, and I, and I, but I can also see the extreme pushback that that you would get from those on the other hand, where they they want that money, they want that a different type of growth because that's all they're used to, or they think that's how the the world will will run. There's a point in time where even the big corporations they realize the stranded assets, and there's a wall to hit, and it's it's just done and over. Um, not a lot of pre-preparation or they've fought against the losing battle, the one that's much bigger than them. And post-growth really, um, it, it discusses all, all the post-growth, but it does it in a little bit much different way than prosperity without growth. And it, it blew me away, story after story. So not only do you talk about um, you know the this how it began but you talk about robert kennedy jr uh yeah and you talk about these stories that go throughout the book and there's two that i want to touch upon so first of all for all my listeners 
I'm not going to give you the whole book. I'm not going to, we're not going to go through chapter by chapter. I'm going to tease it enough. If you don't go out and get it, you're missing something because this is the eye opener and connector of the dots of, of truly how our world works and how we can function, function post growth. But I want to first, well, I won't start with my favorite. I'm going to start with Hannah Arndt. This is her book, The Human Condition, which really didn't get finished. She actually died of a massive heart attack on a celebration on her birthday. And uh, that I, or, human condition did did get finished. It was her later book about um, the life of the mind that was unfinished. The life but, of the mind. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But but it was at the celebration or birthday where she had a massive heart attack, and and there was uh, the start of the next was papers were still on her typewriter, um, but she is an amazing person that really has a lot of lessons, a lot of stories that, um, first of all, she's an American, born in Germany, but American Jewish lady uh, who uh, has written a couple of books, have done fabulous uh, writings as well. But she, to surmise it, and I don't want to do it injustice, she just said hierarchy is bullshit. The people at the bottom of these hierarchies aren't the evil ones making the bad decisions. It's the ones at the top making the most money, making these decisions where they're just doing their job. And um, I know that's a very simple explanation. I'd like you to kind of tell us why she's so vital and why um, she shows us that there's these other models available for post-growth and economics and, and many other things that we really should take a lesson from that we've been repeating for centuries, decades, millennia in our world that right now I'm not seeing a lot of hope for changes, but I, I want to touch upon her. Yeah. A bit. Yeah. I mean, she, she was a, you know, she was a fantastic um, inspirational thinker really. And, um, and, and, and her personal story, as you say, she started, um, she was a born Jewish in Germany during the, the period of Nazism and escaped with her life through over the mountains into Czechoslovakia at a certain point in time after being arrested um, and, and then smooth talking her way out by, by being nice to a Gestapo officer, which is a, you know, just fantastic story. You know, that I can't be harmed. How, how can I possibly be of any harm? Um, you know, I know you're a friendly guy. Let's, uh, let's just overlook this fact that I was uh, spreading some, what you thought of was seditious information. It wasn't really at all. Somebody asked me to put some leaflets out and I did it. And she talked her way out of that and then realized, you know, that it was a difficult, it was an obviously impossible place for escape through the mountains, as they say, into Czechoslovakia. And from there ended up in New York where she lived um, um, until, until her kind of tragic death in her late sixties. And, and this extraordinary kind of clarity of thought. Um, and she, 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 a lot, a lot of it was in some sense, and this is why her last book around the life of the mind was, was so important in a way, was this sense in which thinking is really important. You know, she got this from her, her teacher, um, who was also her first lover, a philosopher called Martin Heidegger. And, and you know, his, his, his ideas around thought have been connected actually sometimes to Eastern transcendental ways of thinking about our, ourselves in the world, the idea that there is a thought world, that it's something that is, you know, doesn't pass away with us, but actually is a, a kind of plane of ideas in which we can exist and coexist and interact with other people. And, and that even if you don't take that slightly transcendental perspective on what thinking and what thought is about, actually the process of, of thinking continually, where are we? Who are we? What are we doing? Doing? What are we doing with our lives? What are we doing with our society? That's the process that, that Hannah Arendt really wanted to stimulate through her work, that critique of who we are, and to do it in a passionate way. What she added to Martin Heidegger's kind of exhortation to think is, is passionate thinking and, and that sense of being really engaged in thought worlds in order to understand ourselves and who we are. And she kind of also felt that in capitalism that we had, we had basically stopped doing that and we'd stopped doing it. In, in, really, in really quite destructive ways. And, and the way that I particularly 
was drawn to her work on that is what she says about what she says about human activity, about the different kinds of human activity, and in particular what she says about labour and about work. And she draws a distinction between those two things. She says labour is the stuff that we're doing when we're really, you know, grinding out a living and a, and, a, and a way of feeding ourselves and maintaining ourselves. And it draws, obviously, from that idea of maternal labour, where we're giving birth to the next generation. And that, and that sense of a very visceral experience, which is very material and physical and involves hard hard labor and hard work and 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 sometimes and this was an extraordinary thing really she said that's the only place we're happy because we're not thinking too much but we're engaged in that task and we're really dedicating ourselves to that task and then she distinguishes that from from the idea of what what she calls work um, and she does it in the following way she sort of says you know once we stopped that once, once we have enough time on our hands and we rest and we look up around us and we're not engrossed in that all-consuming activity of feeding ourselves and looking after our kids and looking after our grandparents, that labour of love that, that constitutes physical basis for us, then we, we find something really, really shocking, which is we, we begin to see our own mortality. You know, we've almost got too much time on our hands at that point. And we begin to see, actually, that we are finite live beings living in a finite world and that we're going to die and the people we love are going to die. And we're terrified of that. So what we, what we, what we throw ourselves into at that stage is this, this work of trying to provide society with continuity, with something durable, with something that will last for over time, that will give us a defense against the insecurity that's generated by thinking of ourselves as mortal. And she put both these things together. It's a fascinating distinction to me. You know, one, we're just embedded in this visceral process of survival. And the other, we're engaged in the very human activity of confronting our own mortality and wanting to build durability from that. And what she says is basically capitalism has denigrated both of these things. It's put that labor of care at the bottom of society. It's rewarded it poorly. It's rewarded it. It's, it's forgotten to give it security. It's forgotten the value of it. And that was, you know, to me, one of the things that came through very, very clearly through the pandemic, that the people who saved our lives in the pandemic for decades had been sort of left behind the, the most precarious incomes and livelihoods, the, the most pressure on them, and, and this sense of continually having to chase productivity targets when the essence of labor is actually care and time and being able to slow down into it and capitalism has done that it's kind of you know it's flipped that idea of labor and as, as care and the foundation of life and said that doesn't matter it's not creating wealth it's not creating greater production it does not contributing to society because it's not money based and and it's an absolutely awful abomination of of the role of care and then she said well actually you know it's, it's even worse than that because capitalism has also denigrated the world of work how can it have done that well it's because essentially that the, what we're trying to build through work is durability the the ability to last through time to give us a sense of continuity to build a world that we can trust and that will support us and our children into the future and capitalism cannot abide durability it's all about obsolescence because if things last too long then there's no need to be building more of them so we build stuff that falls apart that we have to throw away we're encouraged to even when it's not at the end of its life we build innovation after innovation into things in order to escape from durability and so you know, in a sense, capitalism is kind of undermining its own rationale. It's undermining the rationale that we have as human beings because it's throwing away the labor of care and it's undermining the durability that might protect us from our fear of death. And that's what we're trying to do in work. It's just a fantastic analysis of, of the ways in which our, our kind of culture of consumerism and the capitalism that drives it has undermined that you know, that one fundamental thing that I was talking about right at the beginning, the, the, the ability of, of us as human beings to be agents in society, to work and to participate in the creation of a social world. Capitalism has undone all that. 
And she was absolutely, you know, crystal clear in a way she thought about that. And a very, very, you know, very good communicator. She became a kind of icon for, in particular, for, you know, the, the civil rights movement um, in the 1960s and the, and the kind of rebellion on the campuses that Robert Kennedy was talking about. Um, she became someone that the students, she became one of the only professors that the students would actually attend classes for at certain points in time when there was that sense of student rebellion going on because of this sort of, humanity that shines through her work and the lens that she then you know directs at capitalism in order to not just point out its faults but to say this is what you're missing this is what work could be this is what society could be and uh i mean that's that was a long long response but to no, your question it, but it's, it, 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 it's spot on and it, it and it's uh, you you say it obviously much more eloquently than I do, and and that there's much more in the book that really brings it together as well that is so vital. Uh, I, I don't want to simplify it too much, but it's really it's that uh, capitalism and the way we work in many respects. Um, I'm sure your work is different, and I know my work is different, but I think a large majority of humanity is dissatisfied at work and especially in the pandemic and how many people don't want to go back to the jobs they had before because they're actually enjoying in some ways having a little bit more control and freedom to work from home to see how it can be done differently not to be micromanaged or to be turned into uh, um, somebody who punches a clock and a robot and just a number you know, that you can have passion and have, even if you work for a large corporation or an organization, you can still treat it like it's your own baby, like you're part of an intrapreneur of a bigger organization and still value and enjoy that work. Whereas a lot of, a lot of organizations have been really structured in a way, built in obsolescence, not a lot of value. We want you to just be a robot. Don't think, you know, type of a deal. And, and um, I, I really like that. And I, I'm also study a lot around business and, and how to work. And one of, one of my good friends here in Hamburg, um, or actually in Germany, he's from Hamburg, is Tim Leberecht. He wrote the book Business Romantic and Frederick Laloux, Reinventing Organizations. And, and so I like how, you know, how, how do we get that romance back into business, that passion back into our work? And so that there are things that people in humanity do at work that they would never do at their home or they never do if they were the boss. They would like say, no, that's insane. But for a paycheck or because they feel they're boxed into the situation, abhorrent things. And, and another thing that you don't talk about in the book, but Hannah uh, kind of really says, you know, there's things that the Nazis did that, that were abhorrent, but it wasn't those always those individual players that did it because they were evil people. They did it because it was their job. And that was, they were the low man on the totem pole and they were carrying out orders. And a lot of organizations, I hate to put it so brutal, are the same ways. They work for that company. That's the rules. That's the job. they are got to follow the orders, but they wouldn't do it if they were at home or somewhere else. And uh, so that really tells us, you know, as we're functioning on some broken systems, but you give that hope that there is other models. There is a different way to look at it and, and to really uh, not just theory and, and not just be a rebel, but there is a better way, a better operating system out there. And um, because we, we can actually physically, I know, talk for hours and hours, I'm going to have to focus a little bit more on a couple others that, uh, points okay, sure. that I want to make. I was just going to say on that work thing, you know, one of sure. the things that's been Please. fascinating to me is, is that point that you were making about, you know, the choices that we have and the ways to do things differently. And this is something that has really been, you know, very moving in some sense since Prosperity Without Growth was published. And I've been talking particularly with younger students about, about the ideas in it, that many of those students, because that's now 10, 12 years ago that book was published, many of those students are now 
you know, setting up enterprise in a different way, working in a different way, using those models, thinking for themselves. I'm not saying, you know, they did it all because of me. They didn't. They did it because actually that vision makes sense to people. And once you've got that vision, then you can go out into the world and you can do things differently. And I've got, you know, a network now of former students and, and people that I've, younger people that I've worked with who I, you know, I really regard as the pioneers of, of a different way of doing things and, and the extraordinary creativity that they bring to that is a, is a testament to that, that exactly that idea that, that those choices to do things differently exist and they can be acted on. I mean, there's, there are so many books and uh, wise people in our world who, who, who have said that thing, same things, and, and, and maybe in a different way under a different guise. One, one, one of my favorites, I really was a big Joseph Campbell fan, still am. And he always, you know, said, follow your bliss. He says, don't join the wasteland of just doing, you know, what you think you should do. enjoy what you do, what you work. It's the biggest part of your life. We spend, for the majority of us, spend more than 40 hours away from our loved ones working for a living. And, and, that's more time with people that you don't love, that you're not married to, that, you're, that aren't your children. Uh, why, why can't you enjoy that time as well? Uh, you know, what, why can't we have bliss and, 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 and do something that has meaning and joy and gives back to the world? And a lot of this flip of capitalism and, and what we're seeing emerging in the past five years or more is planetary services and leaving the planet better than you found it. How can you be in service to the planet and offer these planetary services, cleaning up the waters or planting trees or doing businesses that are environmentally, social, uh, socially responsible? Um, so there are some better models out there. You do touch upon it, but we're not gonna give any more away because I want people to read the book. There is a thread throughout the book and it, when I read it, and I've read it three times because I just, it, 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 so, I don't know, it was unbelievable that it even came up. I was like, how can this be? I mean, because I, I've been talking about Lynn Margulis, I kid you not, probably for 11 years or more. And people look at me like I'm crazy. I kid you not. They look at me like crazy. Who's Lynn Margulis? What? And and she was Carl Sagan's first wife. And why are you telling me about a symbiotic earth and symbiogenesis? And Mark, you're, you're, going, you're going out on a limb. You're just talking something. I don't understand. And, but, but I do understand. And others are beginning to understand. And there is this kind of, uh, and I'm not, I'm not at all a tree hugger or uh, uh, esoteric. It's, I'm very much grounded in science and math and facts and realities and models that really work the way the world truly works. And so when you first bring her up in the book, uh, uh, just, I mean, that, that was it. You have, I was sold, I, you know, uh, but I've got two of her books here, by the way, and I just want to kind of tease and open, but then I want to have you tell us. So one's a symbiotic planet. And she also came up, she did a movie called symbiotic earth and the other one is the microcosmos. So those of you who have heard me speak about Lynn Margulis below, before, hopefully you figured that out since. Those who have not, I want to just kind of, before Tim tells us a little bit more and, and goes into the importance of this, I want to prelude it. She's the first wife of Carl Sagan. They married very young, both of them very successful and achievers in their own right. Carl Sagan was a wonderful astronomer and, and lover of the earth as well as outer space and did did many great things for our world and um he had the show the cosmos and uh watched it all the time my dad watched it it was just a wonderful time and and read the books lynn margulis was his first wife and then when they divorced and they when they met they she was studying um, Hans Ries's work and, and uh, uh, doing wonderful scientific research about bacteria and microorganisms and uh, um, so zoo, is it zoology, zoonotic, not zoonotics, but zoology and, and biology and different types of uh, things. And, and she um, really did a couple things. One, 
through the bacteria and microorganisms, she came up and said that our world works in the symbiosis, symbi symbiogenesis as well, uh, that these organisms play off of each other and kind of work in cooperation and collaboration. And she turned the entire scientific community almost on its head. She's, she started a scientific revolution. It's basically this rebel who challenged the male-dominated scientific community and proposed a totally new approach to understanding life and the way we understood evolution, the way things worked. And um, she got the Leonardo da Vinci Society uh, 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 inducted her into like their hall of fame and um, recognized her with one of the world's greatest living thinkers uh, of times. And she was also good friends with James Lovelock, who wrote the, the Gaia book, who was, you know, the Lord of the Flies kind of uh, author, uh, said, hey, you should call it Gaia. And, and uh, those two were pretty good friends. But she was just revolutionary because she said, there is no such thing as neoliberalism or neo-Darwinism. It's not natural selection, survival of the fittest, only the strong survive, severe competition. She said, our world works different in a symbiosis. It's cooperation and collaboration and all organisms of which human beings are uh, an organism and have bacteria and, and, and microbes in us, but that we work in harmony with our biome, with our planet, with other organisms. And that's how we can go far. Uh, and uh, so I, I, I've been talking about her many times because we're so dis disconnected from our earth and our planet. So we disconnect ourselves from food. We disconnect ourselves from bacteria and microbes that live in our body. And we have this disconnect. And I'm trying to, to, to show everyone the connection. Not only did Carl Sagan, Lynn's first uh, uh, husband or Lynn's the first wife of Carl Sagan, he said, we're all star stuff. The basic elements of life are star stuff. But those basic elements are the basic elements of our earth. And the very first and longest living ancestor we have is bacteria microorganisms on the earth, which live in us. And we crawled out of that primordial soup, so to say. We are connected to this earth instead of having antibacterial and thinking that's something else. We're connected with the symbiotic earth. And that I think there's a lot of knowledge to have that knowledge and that wisdom or to know to not be ignorant about that so we can move forward with better operating systems that work in harmony with ecological economics and, and with our planet that are better models that don't have a limit to growth. They're regenerative. They continue to regenerate indefinitely. And I probably don't say it as dramatic or nicely as you do, but I've been trying to talk about it and connect the dots for, for people for years. But um, you go on and speak about her many times throughout the book and reference um, I'd just love to, to, to hear a little bit more. How did that come about? And, and what did you discover on this fabulous journey? Actually, I mean, it came about, I, I, I was exposed to, to Lynn's work, um, I guess, quite early on in my career when I was thinking about these mechanisms um, and, and thinking in particular about the role of competition as opposed to the role of cooperation. And, and so, you know, the, the basic evolutionary model um, is is that the whole world is full of competition because it's, a, it's scarce resources and you have to struggle for existence, put those things together, then the only thing that allows evolution to happen is competition. And interestingly, you know, then that metaphor of competition that comes through biology is adopted by capitalism to give a rationale to the competitive framework that we have for the economy. And, and I was interested in a couple of things about that, really. One was One was you know trivially in a way but quite important is that when you look at the history and the social history of the theory of evolution you find that the people that influenced darwin were, were actually economists and economists with a competitive view of the world so that although now capitalism tries to justify its its 
its focus on competition by appealing to a theory of nature. That theory of nature didn't appear out of nowhere. It, it was adopted at a point in time at which early capitalism was beginning to create this struggle for existence that then became the basis of the theory of the evolution. And its defense was on the basis of people who thought that competition mattered. And guess what? They were all old white men, more or less. I mean, Darwin was a bit younger when it came to it, but it, but it was a very male dominated idea. It came from a particular set of ideas and so and then and then so I'd come across Lynn's work and then actually a colleague reminded me um, after she read Prosperity Without Growth that I might have included it in Prosperity Without Growth and I hadn't done and, and so I went back to her and her life story and it's just fantastic you know as you say there was Carl Sagan kind of with his gaze turned to the universe looking for life out there and then was, there was his wife kind of looking looking in the primordial swamp and there's some wonderful videos of her walking on beach is scooping up you know handfuls of, of bacterial matter talking about how long they've been in the world but also talking you know talking about um talking about the the big step that got us from bacteria to primates and 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 indeed to multicellular organisms and it was not about competition it was about collaboration so the, the very foundations of the theory of evolution had neglected this massive mechanism which had allowed evolution to happen and and it was such an extraordinary idea i mean now it's become accepted but back in the day as you say you know she was a a young woman she was 26 or something at the time that first paper was published it was rejected by 15 journals and when she wrote a book about symbiosis it was rejected by the same um book publisher who had commissioned it from her they refused to publish it it was published later and a decade later it was an accepted part of of our view of evolution but she a young woman operating a male-dominated science and and seeing actually that that even our economics even our, our understanding of science everything is seen through these metaphysical metaphorical lenses and how we think about the world and sometimes we just get it absolutely profoundly wrong because we miss out a whole element of what was so critical to our own evolution and it's very very powerful i mean her story is wonderful and the the energy that she has and unfortunately you know she's kind of young enough in history that you can go back and you can look at some video footage of of her talking and uh, giving lectures and this wonderful kind of humanity that shines through her science but also a sense of you know steely nerve because she had to have that in order to fight these scientific fights and and prove to people actually that we had been looking wrong, not just at the economy, but actually at the underlying science that's now being used to generate the economy. We're not just about competition. We're equally about cooperation and collaboration. It was a, it's, it's a fantastic way of, of rethinking who we are. And also it opens up all these new possibilities for us. You know, if we buy the capitalist myth that everything is a struggle for existence in which only the, the fittest survive, then we lock our vision of humanity down into this narrow cage. And, and what Lynn Margulis's work and others do is it just, you know, it, it just blows the bars of that cage apart. And, and, and we are free from a dogmatic science, a dogmatic economy, a dogmatic economics, and into a world where actually we can begin to construct something that, that could work for us. I, I just also, because of what, uh, what you described about Hannah Arndt, I think the two blend together. They're both this symbiotic, different way of, of, of doing structures, the way of organizing, the way things really, how our world truly works. And, and, and time and time, we can fight it. Organizations can fight it for so long. But it always it, it, it's an unwinnable battle because we're fighting our planetary systems. We're fighting, you know, symbiogenesis. We're fighting the life the way it really has always functioned before we were here, you know, and long after we're gone. And uh, it's proven to be a very good model. And that's why, I mean, uh, I, th I think we've touched enough on, on the books and teased it enough. But I mean, that's a good setup on the direction where we're going. I, I want to dive back in, unless I, you didn't get to say something that I know you wrote something down, unless you didn't get to say something, I'd love 
for you to say it uh, now, because I really want to get into your ecological economics, uh, as you are, some of the models that have been presented, and then maybe even discuss why we're not using other models or are our, our into some other topics. Do you have any more to say about post post growth or what we've talked about before we move on? So much that I could say, but we've covered a lot of ground. So let's, yeah, I'm very happy to do that. I'm keen to, to talk about that, uh, Mark. So yeah, Great. fire away. So, so the new emergent has, has been, whether it's an economic model or not, is planetary boundaries from Stockholm Resilience Center, Potsdam Institute of Climate Change, uh, Johan, Dr. Johan Rockström and his planetary boundaries and many other scientists on there saying, you know, we've got these nine planetary boundaries. We're already kind of pushing into the red zone on five of those. He just came out with a book called Breaking Boundaries and uh, a Netflix documentary that could be seen as one economic model that we need to operate in the safe operating spaces of our planetary boundaries. Another one that kind of also goes hand in hand with that is the donut economics from Kate Roworth. And um, that's another model that we've heard about. So different types of economic models that also are thinking donut economics and how do we work within the safe systems of our planet and environment. Um, then there's uh, Matas Wackernagel, the ecological footprint. Um, Dr. Wackernagel, about 35 years ago, I believe it was, started the Earth Overshoot Day and uh, the, the um, kind of using data that we get about our global hectare footprint and our ecological footprint to calculate, you know, if we've done a resource overshoot, which also really ties back to not only Herman Daly was a, one of his original uh, people, he worked on that as well as um, uh, his other partner was Reese another professor bill reese camera. yeah bill reese exactly yeah. that they were just wanted i wanted to that. give a shout out to bill actually because bill was mattis's phd supervisor and, yeah. and the idea of the ecological footprint was as much really bill's as it was mattis's so and he's a lovely guy you know really a lot of wisdom in a in an old soul and um and fantastic sort of influence on that younger as it was then younger generation of of uh, of people like mattis yeah, and, and so and he's he's still going strong. He was on the podcast as well, and I tried try to get into some deeper discussions about things. He's very politically correct, and uh, his organization's going so so strong. Uh, I love it. Did you know that Earth Overshoot Day is July 29th this year? Last year it was August 22nd, day after uh, Sir Ken Robbins passed away so that's how i remember it so august 22nd was last year this year they've moved it up it's uh, july 29th which is what it was i think in 2017 so we're not really gaining a lot of traction we're actually getting worse sustainable development goals report came out normally it comes out in september it came out july 14th because we're so off track in, in doing that and the last economic model that, uh, well, there's two more. Circular economy, Ellen MacArthur Foundation, which is, you know, cradle to cradle kind of thinking and uh, this plan, uh, uh, closed loop system, the organic cycles and technical cycles, circular economy thinking on the way we produce our things. And then there's been a little bit of tickling about the, the new Green Deal, the EU, the Green Deal and, and um, I really want to know, are they all separate economic models that everybody's kind of these camps are pushing for? Okay, we were going to do a circular economy. Okay, we're going to do donut economics. Do they all work together? Can they all be blended into one model of ecological economics? Is there another model out there that's just called ecological economics? And, and that's the model that moves forward. And how in the hell, sorry, Tim, are just the lay people supposed to understand all these models 
what's white and wrong and are all those models fighting capitalism? Are they fighting extractive economies? Are we meant to be confused or what, what's the plan here? <laughs> I think you might have given me an idea for another bookmark as to kind of okay. make some of that clear. But I do think, you know, you're right in a sense, you know, it is quite confusing territory. Um, I mean, it's, there's also something behind it all that's really interesting, which is your your desire. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it at all, but your kind of desire. And I, I hear this language a lot, the desire for a different kind of model, you know, a model that's different from capitalism. And then and, and then so the word model itself becomes, you know, almost associated with our dissatisfactions of where we're going and our desire to be somewhere else. And this sense of wanting a signpost, you know, tell me which way to go, tell me which model to follow, tell me what, what wisdom that will lead me out of this impasse. And, and I think, you know, again, that's very, very understandable. But models themselves, you know, don't, don't really necessarily do that. Models are ways, ways of thinking about our world, of organizing it, and of, of allowing us to think through a problem um, in a particular way. So take the circular economy, for example. You know, it was very easy to see, particularly when circular economy ideas were first talked about. And that, that was kind of back in the, um, actually, when I was beginning to work in my professional life in the mid 1980s. And uh, again, somebody, you know, wasn't Ellen MacArthur, but it was somebody else's idea, Walter Starheld to talk about the circular economy and that idea. Actually, he won an, an essay competition as a student in when he was quite young, talking about that um, circular economy idea. And, and it's a very it's a very obvious thing. It's like, you know, we dig stuff up out of the ground, we produce as much stuff as we can, chuck it away at the end. It's a very linear process. And 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 that, that means that it has a big impact on the planet in terms of the resources we need. It means it's a huge impact on the planet in terms of the waste we're throwing away. And it doesn't even help us much in the middle. Can we think about, you know, bending that curve, as it were, and creating it circular so that that's kind of how it works in nature? You know, the waste of one organism is the food of another organism. The beginning of one chain is the end of another. And this idea of creating, you know, recycling and reusing, that is a, that's, the, that's what the circular economy is about. It's, it's, it doesn't solve all our problems for us, but what it does is it gives us, you know, it's almost like that, that, that question of, you know, what's the metaphor behind economics? Is it competition or is it collaboration? What's the metaphor behind our production system? Is it linear, throwing stuff away? Or is it circular? Is it reusing? So it gives us a kind of lens through which to look at our problems. And similar, I think, for you know, planetary boundaries and, and then the, the sort of donut extension of the planetary boundaries to include the social floor and define a safe operating space. And they can be, you know, that you can make them useful tools. For example, Amsterdam is using the donut framework to organize its sense of the city and, and looking at where it's transcending its planetary boundaries, looking at where it's not meeting its social floor, where it's not giving enough for people and, and beginning to organize our society around that. And, and that's the kind of thing that models can do, but they can't solve all our problems. And, and they aren't a silver bullet, you know, they're not a kind of magic solution. They're ways of thinking about our world that would allow us to see different possibilities. And, and it is, you know, I accept it is confusing. I think the thing really to do is to kind of see what's the, you know, what's the learning, what's the metaphorical lens we're being asked to look at? How can we apply that as we think through where ecological economics is going? And also, you know, how can we, how can we use it to critique the way in which the existing system works, where to find the points of influence, to find the places where we need to change and to identify the policies that could do that. Um, but I don't think, you know, I, I know it's sort of, it's, um, it's, it's sort of, you know, encourage, it's enticing in a way to think that there's a single model that will become the ecological model of the future. And, and, and I'm absolutely convinced that there is a, you know, there's a different perspective. We will not be looking at the world through the perspective of capitalism forever. And we don't necessarily know exactly what that is at the moment, but all of these models and all of these ways of thinking can, can help us on the path towards that different place, towards that better, better place, if you like, that better economy. 
there, there's even Mariana Matsukato with Mission Economics, and and um, uh, then I'm I'm a student of uh, Professor Jeffrey Sachs from Columbia University and the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network, and um, I've also taken his ma macro and microeconomics course uh, that he teaches through that as well. And, and he's written a couple of books on economics as, uh, as well, uh, kind of to give us uh, some information. So you're, am I understanding correct or am I oversimplifying when you're saying each of these models or types of economics, whether it's circular economy or if it's uh, donut economics, are different lenses at looking at models or just different lenses of looking at economics? The dividends are looking at the world, Mark, I think, basically, the I mean, they okay. mostly looking at the world because that and one of them, some of them are saying some very basic things about our economics, which is that ec economists, you know, are bad at taking the physical world into account. And what some of these models are doing is saying, look, you know, your economics looks completely linear. This take it out, make it throw it away as fast as you can. This does not fit with our understanding of the natural world. So 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 it's a way of sort of critiquing that both of the, the world itself and the way the world operates and also the economics that, that, that underlies it. I was going to say something else. I've forgotten um, exactly what it is, but it's kind of, a, I think, a, a, around the idea that at the same time that we're doing this, we've somehow got to connect that thinking to, to the economics that's governing our society at the moment, to the institutions of that. So even though I'm a critic, critic of the GDP, and even though we know that it's not measuring the right stuff, the system of national accounts in which the GDP is embedded is actually a way of organizing our understanding of the economy, telling us what's being produced, telling us what's being consumed, telling us what government's doing, telling us how much investment we need, telling us how much labor there is in the economy. And this, this sense of a model, this, you know, that in some senses is, is such a basic description of our traded economies that we need to be able to connect these visions like circular economy, like donut economy, like the ecological footprint. We need to be able to connect that to the, the working, if you like, the working model of our economies so that we can figure out how that working model also has to change, how we have to change investment, how we have to change work, how we have to change the incentives in enterprise. And you know, and, and also to pick up the places where we've gone missing, just to add another model to the confusion, the one that actually I talk about in Prosperity Without Growth, I call the Cinderella economy. And, and I call it the Cinderella economy because it's, you know, those sectors of our economy that we were talking about before, the care sector, the craft sector, the creative sector, the places which contribute hugely to our lives and the quality of our lives, and yet are poorly regarded by this capitalistic model which is just chasing productivity and just chasing money and 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 it's just another way of sort of saying actually you know the way that we've organized these institutions around this structure and the things we're measuring is leading us astray and we need to we need to identify what's gone missing our care for each other the strength of our relations the quality of our work the the, the impacts on the planet and 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 these are the things that we need to be able to bring back into our frame of reference, not necessarily with an eye to there being an all singing, all dancing solution to all our problems, but definitely in terms of critiquing the way that we organize society and thinking about how we could do it in a different way. So this is where I really want to go out on a limb and um, kind of debate or discuss um, a, an idea, um, a new lens of looking at ecological economics or, or the way our world works um, and, and just throw it out there to you, but maybe you see if we can even get into a little discussion on it. And, 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 and it really ties to everything we've been talking about. It ties to Hannah Arndt, it ties a lot to Lynn Margulis that we're you know, kind of a symbiotic earth and we have to realize what are the, just the natural systems of how our, our world works, which is chaos 30, is complexity science systems, uh, uh, deep, very complex systems. 
Um, and it, and it, it is really based off of, it's kind of a play on this ecological footprint. And so I'm gonna set it up um, a little bit for you. Okay, in the ecological footprint to be replicable, you uh, today you would need 1.6 global hectares that is replicable, meaning you would have enough land, air, water, space, and food to, to live a long, healthy, prosperous life. Prosperity, really, truly 80, 90, 100 years of age, you'd have enough shelter and the basic needs um, with good stewardship to live a ripe old age. And you'd have what you need. It's kind of like the basic needs covered, Maslow's basic needs covered through that 1.6 global hectares. Today, because July 29th, we're at an earth overshoot, uh, we're per person using something like 2.98 global hectares per person, which is a deficit, a resource overshoot. Doesn't matter what the population is, but we'll go with the population today. We'll just, we'll round it up uh, to 8 billion people on this planet. What if we were, were to, um, give everyone on planet earth when they are born and the minute they die, they don't have it anymore. They can inherit it to someone else. Their global hectare for that time period, depending on population and death, that is replicable. And that's their basic rights and alienable basic rights to have as long as they're here on this planet and as long as they have good stewardship over it but it's guaranteed them a long life for everything that they need. They don't need money and they don't need work. They don't need to worry about that. And it's also one that's regenerative. Now, if we couple that with something that is autonomous and tr a trustless system, like, I mean, they're saying distributed ledger technology, blockchain is in some respects a trustless system. But if we worked on more autonomous natural systems like symbiogenesis and the way our world works like Lynn Margulis talked about. And we had that uh, process of that stewardship over that 1.6 hectares that was continually regenerating itself uh, depending on when we grow. When we're babies, we probably won't use 1.6. So then we give the family unit a little bit more of our global hectare because we're in that family unit. And as we're elderly, we give the rest of our family unit a little bit more of our hectare because we don't use that space. But let, let's say as a family, we're living together with four people in a house, less than 1.6 global hectares, passive home, renewable energy. We're not wasting finite resources. We've actually increasing our global footprint, our global hectare for our whole family unit which in turn increases the global hectare for every human being on earth. As a business owner, you say, I'm going to start a production facility producing drinks. I want to produce beer. It's on one hectare of land. And for that one hectare of land, I only need one person to, to run and own that. Or it's on 50 hectares. I need to get 50 people who are willing to say, we believe in this business, we're gonna give you our 50 hectares and it's gonna be one that works within planetary boundaries. But guess what? We're gonna use renewable energy, ambient water harvesting, all the new technologies, but we're gonna do it without greenhouse gas emissions of finite resources. So now we've just increased global hectare of our company, of our people, of our families and the way we live more in harmony with, with our world. I know it's crazy. I know it sounds out there, but it's a new lens. And the more we think innovative, the more we think about sustainable, resilient, desirable futures and how we can do things more in tune with our planetary boundaries or circular economy or even donut economics, we increase that global hectare. And here, I'm going to take it one step further and then I'm going to shut up and I want to get your input. Um, we live, I live in Hamburg, Germany. So I now in the city I live in, I'm going to give my global hectare to Hamburg city and say, I trust you to be a steward for me over my global hectare, but I need enough good energy, water, 
transportation infrastructure, which is sustainable development, which is that what that 1.6 global hectare is. And they says, oh, no problem. You can entrust us with that because we're going to have a good infrastructure. We're going to use renewable energies. We're going to provide plenty of water and influx for the city. So actually, you can live comfortably and not worry. That's the basic need. And I've given it to the city. Now, once that city doesn't uh, uh, obey with that, or my landlord doesn't obey with that, I live in a junky place that's not living within these planetary boundaries, I pack, pack up my global hectare and move to a place that is Eden or that is Pintorn or that is in, in the ecological boundaries. And uh, until we all shift to kind of this, this different model. And, and it's one where it's an alien, inalienable human right, the basic needs of everyone. Everybody gets this equal playing field. So then how can we be capitalists and greedy and steal and do all this other extractive stuff? Well, I'm sure there'll be pe people that will game the system, but we've just raised the bar higher. And so they've got to do it in a different way that doesn't affect the basic needs as needs of humanity of every single human being on earth so anyway that's crazy that's as short as i could probably possibly get it but i would love your input and feedback and see if we can maybe talk about it for a few minutes or see what your thoughts or maybe if i'm even off in left field i think it's terrific i mean you know it's the principle of equity that everybody's that's right and it's equally shared as a principle of sustainability in the sense that you've got the limits and you know what those limits are and you know what you have to work within is a principle actually of a, of a kind of market because you can trade these things and you can trade that regenerative capacity and 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 actually that safeguarding principle around the city and the exchange that happens between the sort of public sector and the private sector is also very interesting. What it reminds me of, I mean, the, you know, I don't want to say it's been done before. It hasn't been done before in quite, in quite the way that you're spelling it out to me, but it does have a sort of pedigree in the sense of ecological space, which was a concept that Friends of the Earth developed. Actually, back in the kind of um, 1990s, I think it was early 1990s, and I, when I was working with them at that time, they were kind of thinking through exactly those sorts of ideas about how, you know, what, what that concept of ecological space might mean if it was equitable and how much could be afforded. And I can't remember it off the top of my head, but there is a book that Friends of the Earth UK put out, and Duncan McLaren was one of the authors of it, where he basically set out a concept not a million miles from what you're suggesting, didn't have all the you know, niceties of, of allocation through a blockchain ledger and the tradability that you might have, which I think is terrific, you know, really creative way to approach that idea of a, of a right to ecological space and a mechanism through which it's allocated and traded. Uh, I, I just think there's quite a lot of mileage there. Mark, I think next you should. And I you know, gave you the short version because there's, yeah. I mean, innovative ways that we can go vertical with uh, um, our global hectare, that we could do seasteading or we could do, you know, uh, uh, cloud hectares or, or something to increase that hectare so that maybe, you know, the, the, the now arable or replicable land that we have that would qualify as a global hectare is continually decreasing. I think it's something like 26 or more hectares per minute that we're losing globally. Soil contamination, drought, fires, et cetera, deforestation. And it, it, it's only getting worse, but there's gotta be a way to restore and regenerate and get into one that increases through through better ways of capturing carbon or storing carbon and, 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 and other models that are more sustainable development when i yeah. when i i mean the reason i loved your sustainable development commission and and reports and what you've done with cus or still are doing with cus is to me sustainable development i come from a background years ago 12 more than 20 years ago in development just regular residential commercial uh, land development and, and, and things to me, sustainable development is like an infrastructure. It's a sustainable development over multiple generations that is passive and renewable and restorative. Um, um, that's how I see it. And, and it's, it's, an, it's not an add-on to business as usual. It's an entirely new operating system. It's an entirely new yeah, economy. Yeah, and yeah. that's how I see it. Yeah, I, 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 it reminds me also of, uh, of something that was in the first edition of Prosperity Without Growth. And I don't know why I took it out because 
people that I've spoken to about it really liked it of this sense in which you know you could have this model of regeneration and the the way in which both enterprise and ecosystems worked together in a symbiotic way to kind of create a regenerative economy and 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 again you know it's a, a lens through which to look at things but I I think it's a, there's, there's some there's some lovely ideas there and I, um, I think we're going to have to definitely have a, a call again and, and catch up on some other terms I'll tell you what we're going to do Mark next time you're going to write this book about um, ecological space and the and the you know the global hectares the shared version of it and and I'm going to interview you. Oh, I would love that. I would absolutely love it. There's another great book, this uh, Parkinson's Law. Have you ever heard of that? I haven't seen that. No, no, I haven't yeah, seen that. Yeah, that's a fabulous book. It basically talks about the original, the um, uh, just just how hierarchies don't work and things. But I have I have four last questions for you, and then then I'll let you off the hook. Um, this is the biggest and hardest question I have for you, but it really kind of is a synopsis and ties together, hopefully, everything we've talked about. It's the burning question, WTF, and it's not the swear word. Maybe you have said it during these crazy 15, 18 months of craziness, but it's what's the futures? And even, even more so, to be more specific, I want to know for you, and and maybe another twist on it would be what does a world that works for everyone look like for you or what's the future and you can even make that plural yeah i mean i i uh well yeah i mean this is this is kind of i i'm not sure whether you're asking that as a personal question as a sort of vision question i think one of the things that i both yeah both okay i mean in, it's certainly in post growth you know i see a world in which I see it. I see one of my criticisms of capitalism is that we kind of stopped thinking about human progress. We stopped, stopped thinking about social progress and it became overburdened with materialism and with the idea of material progress. And I don't think material progress is the same thing as human progress. And I think sometimes, you know, materialism and material comforts impede social progress, impede human progress. So I can, for me, you know, this vision of, of, of the future is, is a place which is, kind of richer in opportunity. And, and I talk in the book, I talk about this concept of psychological flow, which is, again, goes back to that idea of being engaged in the task to the point where you almost lose yourself in the task. And we associate it with sportsmen, with dancers, with, with you know, acrobats, with, but we also associate it with social activity and relationships. We associate it with meditation and contemplative activities. We associate it with craft and the ability to, you know, to really work on something in detail. And, and, and we also know that that goes missing when our lives are too materialistic. So I see this future actually in a very specific sense as being, you know, a, a richer, better, more fulfilling place. And, 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 and that sometimes, you know, the gateway to that place is a recognition of these material limits. And Wendell Berry said it once, um, in, in a beautiful way, he sort of said, you know, human and earthly limits properly understood should not be seen as confinements, but as an invitation to fullness of relationship and meaning. And I, and I think that's, that's exactly what I see that vision for the future is this world in which we can again have a hope for the future, not least because progress isn't stalled and looking at ecological disaster and overburdened with materialism and standing in the way of these deeper satisfactions which the human spirit is capable of and it's a, it's a vision driven by that idea that there is something that we can meaningfully call the human spirit and there is something that we can meaningfully call social progress that that learns through the human spirit um, how to live better I absolutely love that. And I, uh, you, you got the answer right, by the way. I, 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 the, 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 the crazy thing is, is I ask everyone that and, and the answer is different for everyone. And, and I really, I, I wonder if there, there's a whole nother book in, in that in and of itself. Do, do we know what the plan is? Do we know what the road is? Or do we need to be aligned to eventually get there? And, and I, I like in the book, and you just surmised it so nicely with with your your answer, is really 
it's more freeing the less materials we have the better our life goes the better our prosperity goes in, in many respects and it doesn't mean living on the street or being a pauper or, or whatever term you want to use for that it's um it's just a different different way uh, of, of looking at the world the last three questions are really for my guests um, who are thinkers or people that want to get on the right side of history um, innovators, young startups, a lot of activists, a lot of environmentalists, a lot of people from the UN and the World Economic Forum, or who look to those organizations uh, for help for the future to get us to a, a different, um, more sustainable, resilient, desirable future, one post growth, definitely. If there was one message you could depart to my listeners as a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change their life, what would it be, your message? Breathe. I, I always come to, I mean, I think, uh, you know, it's a trivial one in some ways because it is so basic, the idea of breath, but it's also quite a deep one. And I, again, it's something that I talk about in the book. It's one of the things that's at the heart of some of the teachings of Thich Nhat Hanh, the Buddhist monk that I talk about in the book. And, and, and it's a very pragmatic thing. You know, we're, we're, we're apt to be kind of rabbits in the headlights, surrounded by stories of despair and desolation unclear which model we should be using to do what in the world unclear of our next step and to me it's always been the case that actually that that step of just uh, looking stepping back and and taking that moment that pause through which to breathe and to understand that ultimately our existence and and our perceptions are actually fundamentally physiological and and fundamentally linked to the way that we we breathe first of all but also obviously the way that we nourish ourselves and the way that we engage in the world as well and and the first of those to me is always and uh, you know it's something that I've seen Thich Nhat Hanh talk about over and again is is just that simple step of being aware of the breath what should young innovators in your field be thinking about if they are looking for ways to make real impact? Or what do you tell your students? I, I tell them I tell them that there is no single answer to that question. That it depends. It really depends on you know a, a number of things: their skills, uh, their passion, and uh, and this might seem seem a bit strange, but what the world asks them to do, um, you, you know. And when those three things align, then you know that that's the point at which you become that kind of creative individual engaged in the world in, in, and, and engaged in action and engaged in action for change and, and paying attention to those two things, I think is, is the, is the answer to that question, not pointing anybody in any particular direction, but understanding your, your skill, your passion and, and what the world is asking from you. The last question is, what have you experienced or learned in your professional journey so far that you would have loved to know from the start? Oh, all of this that we've been talking about. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, I do have a, you know, I'm kind of, I'm not right at the end of my career, but I'm definitely later in it than I am earlier in it. And, and, and so I have, you know, and it's a very, is that kind of goes together with that sort of fear of mortality that we were talking about. I know that it's going to stop and it's not going to be that many summers before it stops. Um, and, and so this sense, I think of, you know, we, we, we can't, we can't go back. We don't, we never can go back and we can never wish for ourselves that we knew everything that we do now at some former point in time. But I think, you know, there are bits of that wisdom that I think you can learn very, very early on. And again, I would probably reach for Tish Nhat Hanh in this because, you know, he has a very, he has a very profound way of saying um, wherever you are, your, your life really is, is, is a kind of a journey. And you can't, you constantly think the journey is about getting you home somewhere, but actually home is the journey. And, and it's, it sort of turns that idea on its head in such a fundamental way that wherever you are in your life, you can begin to sort of ground yourself and make sense of it and feel that you, your path through life is a, is a thoroughly unique one. Um, and you don't 
get the right to change it afterwards. You don't get the right to predict it in the future, but you do have both the right and the responsibility to kind of be aware of that place, of that journey. And I think that's a, you know, that's a very profound sort of learning that I think, and we, and we don't really teach that to our kids. We don't, you know, I didn't have that uh, 35 years ago when I was kind of starting out. And, and it's something that I would wish for everybody, really, that sense of, uh, of a place, of a journey, of a person, and and of a of an interaction in in our world that is thoroughly unique and forever creative. I'm so thankful um, that the world has given us you and that you exist, and your your students are very fortunate to have such a wonderful teacher and professor um, to give them guidance. Prosperity without growth, please go get it, read it from end to end. Post growth, please go get, get it and read it. Uh, my listeners, it's, it, they're both fabulous reads. And um, I hope that this uh, has been good for everyone to listen to. I thank you very much for letting us inside of your ideas, Tim. It's been a journey and a, a huge learning lesson. I really thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Mark. It's been a it's been a pleasure being here, and don't forget to write that book. I won't. I will. I'm already working on a couple others. Fantastic. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye.